Our story begins in the midst of the Battle of Hjorengaver during the year 987, where we witness two legendary Jomsviking warriors by the names of Thors and Thorkel battling their way through hordes of enemies, one of which forced Thors into the sea. Here, instead of resurfacing immediately and continuing the battle, Thors would fake his death, retire his Viking career, and escape with his wife Helga, along with their newborn daughter, Ilva. Fifteen years later. The year was 1002, and the couple had settled down in a place far away from the tyranny of Norway's king and the terrors of war, Iceland. This Icelandic village was home to a 15-year-old Ilva, as well as Thor's and Helga's son, a 6-year-old Thorfinn. Besides them, the Leif Eriksson was also a resident of their village. One night, Leif was recounting the tales of his adventures to the children of the village. He went on to describe a land far to the west, with flat grasslands sprawling as far as the eye can see. Leif dubbed this idealistic land Vinland, and instilled a spell of excitement in Thorfinn's eyes. Not long after that, the English launched an assault on a Danish settlement in England, granting King Swain of Denmark the perfect opportunity to initiate a war, which he did. Captained by Floki, a warship arrived at the aforementioned Icelandic village. Their goal? To reinstitute Thors into the fabled Jom's Vikings for the upcoming war, to which he succeeds via blackmail. Soon enough, they had prepared a vessel ready to set sail. Before that, though, Thors discovered his son rummaging around the storeroom searching for a weapon to defeat their enemies, to which he rebuked him for doing so with a heartfelt, You have no enemies. No one does. There are no enemies. No one out there deserves to be hurt. No one at all. And so, after bidding everyone farewell, Thor sets sail with a few other capable individuals to meet up with the Yom's Vikings. Unbeknownst to them, though, a young Thorfinn had also tagged along. Meanwhile, on the Faroe Islands, we are introduced to Oshlod and his men, who it turns out were hired by Floki to assassinate Thors. The first step of their plan was to trap them in the valley. Before Björn was able to hop onto their ships, Thors beat him to the punch and proceeded to knock out any attacker with one blow. It looked as if Thor was on a collision course with victory, before halting and challenging Oshlod to a duel. The grounds of said duel being, if Thors is victorious, Oshlod will withdraw, and if they don't, they gain Thors' group as slaves. Oshlod agreed to the terms. Throughout the duel, Thors is in total control, and once he had Oshlod on the brink of defeat, he paused and repeated the words, I believe that a true warrior does not need a sword. The reason I must rely on a thing such as this is proof I am incomplete. Next, Oshlod conceded defeats in the duel, but it didn't take long for him to sign to the archers above. A volley of arrows descended from the valley top, fatally piercing the legendary troll of Yom, Thors, leaving poor Thorfinn destroyed. With their mission complete, the pirates set sail, but soon discover someone had been aboard Thors' old ship. That someone being an absolutely broken, confused, depressed, and revenge-driven Thorfinn. Eventually, they halted their ship when they reached England to rest and resupply. And by that, I mean pillage. Thorfinn, yet again, must witness a tragedy at the hand of Oshlod. Later, he would steal himself to murder the man in his sleep. At the last second though, he changed his mind and decided to perform the deed with honor, in a duel. Of course, he lost horribly. You could hardly even call this a duel. Now deathly parched, famished, and hurt, young Thorfinn would stumble into the woods in search of some way to satisfy his basic human needs. Meanwhile, Leif and the others arrived back to deliver the message of Thor's death to his wife and daughter, who were of course sorrowful, even if Ilva didn't show it at first. During his time in the forest, Thorfinn would continue to hone his foraging skills alongside his swordsmanship, and now had amassed enough basic skills to not have to rely on Oshlod's men for food. Because of his newfound abilities, it was time for a rematch with Oshlod. Though his sudden exponential growth in battle prowess was on full display, the boy was still curb stomped by his foe once again. Oshlod then gave Thorfinn a task if he wished to initiate another duel with him, achieve great feats on the battlefield. After some downtime, the band set sail once more, next landing themselves in the vicinity of Gainsbro. Here, they suffered a surprise attack by the English, and it's in this battle where Thorfinn would kill his first human being, cementing himself on a path of no return, as a boy blinded and driven strictly by vengeance. 
Thorfinn's kill counts continued to rise to an innumerable level, as he persevered through many of England's bloody battles. During his late childhood leading into his adolescence, Thorfinn's fighting style would evolve to become that of a dual dagger wielding and speed focused technique. One time, Oshlod ordered Thorfinn to scout a village, but on the way there, he was ambushed, just barely managing to survive. This clash left him bleeding out and drifting through a river. Ironically, he was found, saved, given a meal, and even cleaned by the very villagers he was supposed to be murdering that night. Later, Thorfinn would attempt to warn the mother and daughter about the attack, but they did not heed his warnings. Following through with the plan, a house on the beach was suddenly set aflame by Thorfinn, signaling for the Vikings to come ashore. Then he saw her. As he was murdering the English soldiers, the woman who treated him with so much unconditional love and kindness, the sort he hadn't experienced in years, was watching him mercilessly ending these soldiers' lives in horror. In a panic, he ordered her to escape, but she did not. The woman was simply paralyzed by shock, standing there until Oshlod's men arrived, which is where she was presumably murdered, right in front of Thorfinn's eyes. Year 1012 in France, the band come across a skirmish between two Frankish clans and select to help the side attacking the fort. This time to gain access to another duel, Thorfinn was required to retrieve the enemy commander's head, which he did. While that was happening, Oshlod's 100 men were encircling the fort to execute a pincer attack. They may do with excellent pace, granting them enough time to thieve all of the fort's valuables before the other Frankish clan could even break down the main gate. With their objective complete, they sailed off with the treasure, not leaving a single piece of gold for their temporary ally. Now, with enough money to make it through the winter, they could return back to Oshelod's village. Once settled in, Gorm, the chief of the village, agreed to be an overseer of yet another one of Thorfinn and Oshelod's duels. In the beginning of the showdown, Thorfinn displayed that not only had his prowess with the daggers evolved, but so had his intelligence in battle. This is brilliantly exemplified when he thrusted against Oshelod's attack so as to negate his blow and springboard away. This also doubled as a perfect opportunity to reset the fight back to square one. Oshelod soon even began to show signs of defeat, so it's clear the boy's instincts in battle had been honed masterfully. On the other hand, what Thorfinn hadn't honed masterfully was his ability to control his anger. Realizing he was fighting a losing battle, Oshelot began mocking the death of Thors, which sent Thorfinn into a frenzy, leaving him incredibly open, ending the duel in seconds. Oshelot 3, Thorfinn 0. Next, in August of 1013, the Danish King Swain's army was preparing for the coming offensive against England. At Gainsborough, Denmark's army forced the five largest towns to surrender. The main force then marched south, their momentum showing no signs of losing steam. They continued to advance, laying waste everywhere they passed through. However, their seemingly unstoppable march was finally halted at the merchant town of London in October of 1013. The reason for their halts could be attributed to one factor, a beast of a man known for many titles, most popular of which being Thorkel the Invincible. Having switched to the English side because it would simply be more fun, this tower of a man stood atop London Bridge, denying any Danish ships even attempting to sail close. One of which being Oshelod's ship, with Thorfinn atop the mast. Oshelod's challenge to him this time was taking Thorkel's head. During their duel, his gigantic stature proved a problem for our 17 year old Thorfinn. He couldn't reach many of his vital points, so he settled on two fingers and retreated with Oshelod and the main force. Before that, though, Thorkel asked his name, to which he shouted, I am Thorfinn, son of Thors. With Thorkel then putting one and two together, realizing his father was the same warrior he fought alongside all those years ago. Following that, King Swain decided to leave his son, Prince Canute, to deal with London's siege, while their main force marched on to take over the rest of England. Later on, Thorfinn had a dream of his father telling him to stop his quest for revenge, and of him asking Thorfinn if it would truly make him happy. The dream ended with his father being pierced by arrows, akin to his actual death, waking Thorfinn instantly. 
he wasn't able to fall back asleep, and so the boy explored the nearby ruins, which he soon discovered were not buildings of the current Saxons, but were from the previous inhabitants of these lands, the Romans, via Oshlod's teaching. During his lessons at Thorfinn, the two spotted an ally on horseback, who would later inform their band that Prince Canute's 4,000 men, in charge of besieging London, were routed by Thorkel's eight times smaller army of 500. He also informed them that Thorkel had taken the prince along with his priest, hostage, and was marching his way to the main force, following their tracks quickly. Upon finishing his briefing, Oshelad ruthlessly beheaded the man. Oshelad claimed their new goal was to rescue Prince Canute and take on Thorkel's 500 men because of the sure riches to be had in doing so. In an ambush, Prince Canute's chief retainer, Ragnar, and his men attempted to fool Thorkel's army, proclaiming they numbered 2,000, but their lives were easily snuffed out by Thorkel, who provoked them, realizing they only had about 400 at most. In the midst of their battle, Oshelad's band were working together behind the scenes to encircle the battlegrounds in fire, and as a byproduct, creating a veil of smoke, thus thrusting the battlefield into chaos. Doused with water, Thorfinn was tasked with retrieving the prince amidst the confusion. Before he could do much though, there was Thorkel, who joyfully informed the young warrior of his late father's legendary status, announcing Thoris to be the only man stronger than himself along with describing him as a true warrior. They didn't have quite the time to reminisce though, as the Raging Blaze was quickly enveloping their surroundings. Having to act fast, Thorfinn, Prince Canute, Ragnar the Priest, along with the Prince's other guards, followed the boy's lead back to Oshlod. After arriving, they humbly accepted the duty of escorting the Prince back to the main headquarters. And so, Thorkel's pursuit began. On their trek to the headquarters, Oshlod spotted a ferryman who he tasked with delivering a letter to the elders on the land across River Severn, that land being the country of Wales. During their march, with only a near sleepless night as their rest, the beginnings of distrust and skepticism begin to bubble amongst Oshlod's crew. Oshlod said he requested reinforcements, but it would take days before any of their allies would even reach them, so their doubts continued to amass. Just then, Oshlod was thankfully proven right. The reinforcements were of no relation to King Swain, though. Having responded to Oshlod's letter, Welsh commander Gratianus brought a few ships with him. The Danes then used those to flee to Wales. In this new realm, their mission continued across the now mountainous terrain, and Thorfinn was assigned bodyguard of Canute during this time. Of course, only under the conditions that a duel would be had once they reached Gainsborough. On their way through Wales, they were ambushed by men from Brackenyog, a kingdom separate from their earlier reinforcements. But they failed to hit anyone with their volley of arrows. Because of this, Oshlod discerned they were simply acting. In an attempt to scare them, Oshlod attempted to convince Canute to say some words of intimidation but the sheltered prince could not make a peep and ended up hiding behind Ragnar. In his stead, Oshelod and Gratianus began a private discussion with their commander, Asser. Oh, and we also learned here that Oshelod can speak Welsh fluently. In said discussion, Asser is informed Oshelod is in fact the son of Lydia, a direct descendant of the mightiest Roman Celtic commander, Artorius of Britannia. We also discover how, and in turn, why Oshelod carried his mother onto Wales. She was dying and wanted to come back to where her roots lay. That's when 14-year-old Oshelod met Gratianus. Not only was he the son of Lydia, but also of Olaf, a Danish warrior. With these conditions, Oshelot's end goal was made clear at this moment. Become a covert operative within the Danish army, then install Canute as the new king, thus leading into him taking an important post within the power structure. Should that happen, Oshelot would finally be able to conclude an ironclad non-aggression treaty with Wales. Asser had no choice but to accept their plans, and couldn't help but simply laugh. Quelling the would-be flames of battle, the Danes progressed forward, having to act as prisoners while passing through the villages on their path. During their acts, the prince at last spoke up for himself after being provoked by Thorfinn, exclaiming the reason he was so quiet is because of his royalty status. Anything he says will be taken with political meaning. So, as not to act out of line, his caution is paramount above all else. Earning the prince some respect from Thorfinn. Making it through the village, Oshelot made the quick and dirty decision to hike over the mountains to save time before winter snows them in during their trek around the mountains. 
Only thing is, winter arrived far sooner than he'd hoped, and before they even reached the halfway point, a blizzard had been summoned, re-establishing the band's bubbling mistrust in Oshlod. Just then is when they stumbled upon a village hidden away inside Mercia's embrace. Running low on supplies, energy, and sustenance, the Norse Vikings did what they do best. First, they rounded up the Christians in the center of the village. Once they finalized gathering all their rations, they, without hesitation, continued to slaughter each and every one of them until every single poor soul in this community was brutally and utterly slaughtered without remorse. That is, aside from one pure village girl by the name of Anne, who the Vikings had missed, having to bear witness to a horror no human should ever have to experience. As the sole survivor of the Mercia village massacre, Anne would go on to indirectly inform Thorkel of Oshlod's whereabouts in Gloucester. With the help of the ear, it took no time at all to realize the English had discovered their whereabouts in only 10 days of downtime. That afternoon, upon noticing Thorfinn had caught a rabbit, Ragnar invited the boy to help with lunch, to which he agreed after some apprehension. During their meal, a messenger arrived to tell them preliminary battling had already begun. Upon learning they were planning to rout the English soldiers and continue into enemy territory, Ragnar was furious and demanded an audience with Oshlod. The messengers led the way, or at least that's what he assumed was happening. In actuality, they led him into a trap. Of course, by Oshlod's orders. This was to instill further growth in Prince Canute. In his dying breaths, he informed Oshlod of his theory as to why King Swain sent Prince Canute to the battlefield, as assurance of Canute's death and his other son, Prince Harold, succeeded his position as king. Ragnar exclaimed Prince Canute's true enemy at this moment was none other than his father. That night, Oshlod's men received dreadful news. Thorkel was back on the hunt, and he was close. The bubbles of insubordination had finally reached a boiling point in many of Oshelot's men. At this point, deserters were appearing left and right in hopes of joining forces with the clear winning side, Thorkel. Mercifully, Oshelot did not condemn these men. In fact, he insisted they choose whichever leader they pleased. Unfortunately for them, mercy wasn't in Thorkel's vocabulary, as Thorkel uncaringly hacked them down. At this point, even longtime members like Otley and Torgrim were becoming unsettled. Soon after destroying a bridge to prevent Thorkel's ban from crossing the stream, there he was. In the blink of an eye, a spear shot out from the mountaintop, fatally piercing four men multiple kilometers away. Thorkel the Tall had ultimately caught up, and their end was near. Oshelot demanded the march continue, but his men were at their breaking point. A mutiny was upon him. The last loyal member, Björn, along with Thorfinn Knuts and the priest were given the orders of continuing onward via sleigh. Before the battle with his own men commenced, Oshelot's mind wandered to a time in his past of him taking care of his sickly mother, who was explaining to him the story of Artorius. The loathing for his father, who threw her away like trash once she became ill, surfaced in his mind. The recollection of all the evil he would commit without batting an eye, and the remembrance that all of his men were the exact same as his father. Oshelot then declared, all this time, more than a decade I've spent living and working with all of you. I have hated every one of you with every ounce of my being. You dim-witted fucking Danes are all lower than pig shit. Leading into Oshelot's first swing. Back with the prince, the pursuers managed to halt their retreats by killing their horses. In a pinch, Björn used his last resort, a berserker mushroom. While Björn was busy dealing with every one of them, Thorfinn realized Oshlod was who he truly should be worrying about right now. His prey was about to be murdered before he could exact his revenge. So, Thorfinn charged straight ahead, back to Oshlod's location in desperation. Speaking of Oshlod, his 50 v one roadblock was underway, and he damn well may have won if Torgrim didn't decide to order for the use of arrows. Right then, Thorkel at last arrived, and as a collateral, saved Oshlod from his execution for the time being. Torgrim was challenged by Thorkel, but the utter pressure and surely fatal circumstances he was in absolutely destroyed the seasoned Viking's mind. Just then, to Thorkel's joy, a raging Thorfinn emerged from the horizon with a battle cry, demanding he not lay a finger on Oshlod. So, to determine who's able to take final possession of Oshlod, the duel between nephew and great uncle was set in motion. Closing his eyes as an escape from Björn's battle, Knuts fell asleep and was met with an apparition of his father figure, Ragnar, who bids him a proper farewell in his dream. After awakening, the priest greets him with one hell of a philosophical question. What 
is love. The priest believes death to be the true meaning of love. Once a human life is over, their bodies will essentially give back to the planets, be it nurturing the soil, providing meat for all manner of wildlife, and all the while not uttering a single word of complaint. Being indiscriminate is the true essence of love, and the prince soon realized this as well upon experiencing an epiphany. This question coincided with Thorkel's inquiry to Thorfinn. Ever since Thor's told him he'd finally learned what it meant to be a true warrior before escaping the Yom's Vikings, this question had become omnipresent in his mind. What makes a true warrior? Thorfinn wasn't able to grant him an answer, and understandingly, Thorkel didn't mind him not knowing. Of course, after witnessing Prince Canute's epiphany, we can discern that love itself is what makes a true warrior. Throughout their battle, Thorfinn was proving to be a seemingly even match for Thorkel. Though never able to cut deep, blows were still landing one after the other. Thorfinn was reading Thorkel's every move, but the battle eventually reached a turning point. With a monsterful kick, it sent the boy skyrocketing into the air, soon landing after a few trees broke his fall. Furthering Canute's epiphany, the prince even becomes enraged at God in the realization that it is impossible for many to reach the salvation he promised, proclaiming that he himself, instead, will lead the way to recreating that paradise on Earth. Prince Canute, now a completely changed man, declared if the surviving men follow him, he will grant their lives true meaning. For that is the duty of a king. Since there was a lull in the duel, Ashalad decided to assist Thorfinn, and begrudgingly, he accepted. Ashalad recalled the Battle of Malden, where he bore witness to Thorkel the Invincible collapsing after suffering a blow to the face. So that's what the two attempted. With a bit of trickery, they managed to succeed. Knocked down, Thorfinn hammered the nail in the coffin and punctured Thorkel's eye with his bare hands. This action fueled an eruption of anarchy within Thorkel's troops. That's when Thorkel stepped in for defiling the honor of their duel, fully ready to attack his very own men. Then Prince Canute makes his arrival, declaring any more death would be pointless. Thorkel admitted his loss, and also decided to assist Canute in his coming conflict against King Swain. Canute accepts, and appoints Thorkel, Thorfinn, Oshlod, and everyone else still alive as his retainers, as they march their way back to Gainsbro. To Floki and, well, everyone's complete disbelief, Prince Canute had not only arrived at Gainsbro safe, but he'd also gained many new attendants, the main one being Thorkel. Returning a summons from King Swain, Canute, along with Oshlod and Thorfinn, enter his domain. After expressing his disapproval for Canute to become king, the looming men ready to ambush showed themselves from the balconies above. Next, Swain offered Canute an ultimatum, die here or live out your life peacefully in Cornwall. Before he could answer, Ocelot steps in and pleaded he reconsider. London's riches are now his, and the one who made the great sacrifices to bring about these fruits of battle is none other than Canute. Understanding his situation, Swain agreed, and in contrast, decided to reward them. That night, Otley and a still mind-broken Torgrim decided to set off, promising Ocelot to never set foot on the battlefield ever again. Some time later, the prince and Ashlod were arriving at the head of a noble procession of ships in York. Before long, the prince, or rather a body double, was shot, and Thorfinn chased down the assassin until landing on top of him, stabbing into his back. Unbeknownst to him, this happened to occur right in front of none other than Leif Erikson. Upon realizing who this was, tears burst out from Leif's eyes. Before any real reminiscing could be had though, Thorfinn lost his cool after Leif asked him to come home, exclaiming nothing will be enough until he exacts his revenge, and then walks off. During the following days, parts of Ashalad's plan to take down the king were enacted in the form of rumors that King Swain desired Canute's execution. Here, we also find out the assassin was hired by not Swain, but Ashalad, all to give these rumors more credence at the coming royal meeting tomorrow. The day after, it was time for Ashalad and Thorfinn's final duel. Well, before that, another duel was scheduled. A fatally wounded Bjorn appeared to face Ashalad in battle. After declaring their friendship, the warrior was struck down by Ashalad. Ashlod, granting his soul entry into Valhalla. Now it was Thorfinn's turn at Ashlod. Unlike some of their other duels, this bout's victor could not be questioned at any point during its runtime. Ashlod had assumed total domination without even using his sword, reading Thorfinn's every move with ease. Once Thorfinn awoke, 
Ashlot explained the reason he constantly loses against him, that reason being the forsaking of his training and even the thought process he dons during battle. His emotions win over his mind every instance they duel, creating a situation Ashlot is able to effortlessly control. Ashlot then sat down and told Thorfinn a story of his youth, a story of how he managed to kill his own father. He was far more methodical in his approach and certainly didn't end Olaf's life in a duel, explaining how it is you kill someone you truly hate. He ended the story by calling Thorfinn an idiot for not realizing this, and even thanked him for continuing to do his bidding so long as he agrees to these farcical duels. To really get under his skin though, Ashla went on to thank Thors as well. This broke. Thorfinn. The next day, we see him stumbling around town, ending up getting into a fight and getting thrown in jail for it. The time for the royal meeting had finally arrived. Matters were transpiring according to Ashalot's predictions, so he was quite pleased with the king's speech. Well, not for long. Swain mentioned their next offensive would be against Wales, to quell any rebels that may show themselves there. Of course, this shook Ashlod down to his core. The gears in his mind began turning, attempting to think of some kind of solution to remove Wales from becoming a fiery wasteland. Back at the jail, Leif ended up visiting Thorfinn, informing him that he had a responsibility to his father, to bring his child back home. Ever since that day 11 years ago, it's been his main driving force, his sole goal he swore to himself he would do on his honor as a sailor. Leif then began describing a place Thorfinn knew all too well. Far to the west, across the ocean, filled with ripe fruits and green rolling grasslands, there lies a new world. Vinland. Leif continued, requesting he come home, and after resting his bones, would head out to that land together with him. After all, Thor's desire to go there as well. That statement finally convinced him, and the two arrived at Leif's boat. Before they could set off though, Thorfinn disappeared. Back at the meeting, the king offered the warrior captains rewards as gratitude for their feats in the past war to overtake England. Eventually, it came to Oshala's turn to receive his reward. Once in front of the king, he questioned him, asking if this coming campaign against Wales is truly the smartest option. With the country's rough terrain, it would simply not be worth the trouble. Countering his suggestion, the king whispered to Oshlod an ultimatum. It's either Prince Canute's death or Wales becoming a sea of flames. Those words were the last straw Oshlod needed to hear to steal himself for what he undeniably must do. Drawing his blade towards King Swain, the warrior announced himself not as Oshlod, but with the name his mother gave him, Lucius Artorius Castus, the rightful king who should rule this land of Britannia. With one clean swing, King Swain was decapitated, throwing the whole room into a panic. Ashalot began to feign madness while slicing the guards down, all so that the king's death could be blamed on him and him alone. To put an end to this and slay the assassin, Prince Canute himself would fulfill his role and stab his sword right through Ashalot's heart, opening a fatal wound. At that moment, Thorfinn arrived with anger at Ashalot, the man who not only killed Thors, but the man who raised him for the majority of his childhood dying not by his hands. Through these heavy emotions, he was able to hear a question. From here on, after I'm finally dead, how do you plan on living your life, Thorfinn? You must move on. Move ever forward, beyond even the world which Thors went. You, son of Thors, go. That is your true battle. You must learn to become a true warrior, son of Thors. Go, Thorfinn.